Texas some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Hey, welcome to the program. My name is Chris Spangle. This is another in our series of the path to libertarianism. I'm going to talk to our friend Ryan Lindsay about his path. He's uh, got an interesting point of view that is different than a lot of libertarians you might hear. And uh, you'll hear why as we go on. If you're coming from the left, then I think you'll really appreciate his point of view. So stick around and stay tuned. We'll be back right after this. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the program. As you heard that uh, dulcetron man say, my name is Chris Spangle, and welcome to the program. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. So nice to have you here, uh, especially with these PATH episodes. I know that that is a lot of new people, so if you're new to libertarianism or you're just checking us out, trying to take us for a test drive before the presidential year, then we welcome you and say hello, and we hope that we won't disappoint you too much. Um, we're going to disappoint you. It's only a matter of time. Uh, the, the person that I am talking to today is the editor and the founder of Wall Reader, W-A-L Reader, which you can find on Amazon. Just go in and type in W-A-L Reader or go to wallreader.com. And that is, uh, would you call it our magazine, Ryan? Yeah, I think uh, that's fair to say. I mean, We Are Libertarians is your network, so if you want to call it that, <laughs> it's, that's what I, would I call say, it. Uh, an intellectual journal, a magazine, whatever it, whatever you want. It's sort of like Wall itself. It's whatever the person wants to adapt it to be. Is Are we professional? Yes. Are we not professional? Absolutely. So <laughs> we're, we're all things to all people sometimes. So definitely check that out. It's absolutely great. I'll tell you, Ryan, the first time that I got the printed version in the mail, and I always buy like five or six of them for uh, posterity's sake and maybe giveaways in the future, but also because I love it. I really, when I got the first one, um, you'd kind of been working on it. You'd been putting stuff together. I kind of breezed through some of the articles. Like my, my thing as a, an editor-in-chief of all things Wall Network is that I really say, all right, you want to use the platform? Cool. Do your thing. And I don't really, I think I told you no for the first time when you asked to have that nut job that wrote that stupid vermin supreme, <laughs> Joe Papadopoulos or whatever. You were kidding, but. Um, uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but I got it and I was just super impressed with it. And I think it's such a cool idea. And there, uh, there was a, an article in the first one about, what is a libertarian socialist and it caused so much controversy and people <laughs> yelling at me going how could you have such a, a, a an article in in a libertarian magazine and i said i don't care um <laughs> I, I really try to just let people do their shows and get out of their way yeah and the funny thing about that article is it got so much criticism but uh not once every everybody that challenged it or not everybody, obviously, but whenever I saw people saying like, oh, this isn't libertarian or whatever, all I did would challenge them, like find one instance in that article where the author was uh, suggesting that, you know, force should be initiated against anyone and nobody ever could because Kenton, the author of that wasn't, that's not what he was doing. It was a critique of capitalism, not a call for government force against people. And I imagine that you did what I did, which is, hey, if you'd like to write a rebuttal for the second issue, go ahead. Did you ever receive one submission? No. Okay. Nope. Not okay. a single one. Right. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about Wall Reader. What, I what exactly is it? Yeah. So it is uh, it's a journal, a magazine um, that I put together with several other people uh, from the Wall Network. Uh, Hody Johns has been a ton of help with it as far as recruiting people and uh, writing for it and everything. Um, and it's basically just, you know, every few months I try to put a issue out 
and um, we just uh, write about, so far each issue has kind of uh, had a certain theme, like the first one was, um, you know, what does libertarianism mean to you? How did you get here, et cetera. Then the second one was all about uh, immigration, different libertarian stances on immigration. Um, and then this most recent one was sort of, we tried to have a more positive look at, uh, you know, America and even the American government, some of the stuff that has improved over the past couple centuries or is still getting better. Um, but the, the cornerstone of each article is really trying to portray a, uh, a diversity of thought, thought that um, necessarily isn't going to be extremely common in uh, mainstream political thinking or even uh, libertarian thought and just trying to not have an echo chamber. Like you said in the first article, you know, there was something about libertarian socialism, um, but there was also a lot of articles that were like praising capitalism and people talking about like their love for free markets being why they became libertarians. Uh, the second issue that had a ton of um, opposing opinions in it, but nothing that I would say was, uh, none of them were not libertarian. You know, you had people saying we need pretty strict immigration controls. Some people saying that no, open borders are the way to go and they're all libertarians. Um, so I just tried to collect those thoughts all in one place and present, present them all to the readers. So how did you, why did you decide to start it? And you know, how did you get going? I mean, what, what is your, uh, what is your operating philosophy too? I mean, so what, why did you start it and what was the impetus? Like what was the force of it? Yeah. So, um, I guess I started it just, I've, I've always been a really big fan of print journalism. Uh, I know that's old school in this age, but I've just, uh, you know, magazines, um, like I read reason and the Atlantic, those every month, whenever I get those, it's like Christmas 12 times a year for me. Um, so like I've, I've always really enjoyed, and I grew up like all through middle school reading the, uh, you'll appreciate this, but the, uh, the Limbaugh letter, um, mm -hmm. my grandpa subscribed to it and he'd always give those issues to me when he was done with them. So I've always I subscribed for a period of time, which is why I have a Rush Limbaugh mouse pad in my, in my office. <laughs> and I, I got the Glenn Beck magazine. I always thought fusion and the Limbaugh letter. I always thought that was like a cool add on to the radio show. Yeah. So like it, was a, it was thrilling for me when you said that you wanted to do this because it, it echoes back to that. But I, yeah. I too, I like, I watched all the president's men when I was like 13 and I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to do journalism. Mm -hmm. And it, it morphed into whatever this is, but, um, <laughs> you know, I was, uh, like, I don't know if you've read working by Robert Caro, you, you would go crazy for it, but, um, yeah, I, th that's interesting. So this is sort of, uh, an output of those early, early dreams. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, like you said, I've always been like interested in journalism. Like I love the idea of journalism as an institution. I think it's really important. Um, and I love writing. Writing's always been one of my like favorite hobbies and pastimes and all. Um, and I do a di way different kind of writing, but professionally as my career. Um, and so, you know, and I'm a big fan of the We Are Libertarians Network and the show you've put together. And so uh, whenever I was listening to the episode, I guess about a little over a year ago at this point where you pretty much just put out an open call. Like if you want to contribute to the network, like let me know and I'll find a way to let you. And so I was kind of like, well, I have always wanted to, you know, in the back of my mind, one of those ideas like, Oh, it'd be cool to have like my own journal or magazine. And then you put out that call. So I'm like, why not? Let's see what he thinks. And, uh, and like, I didn't really have a, terribly high hopes for the first issue i didn't think it's like i've never done this before like i have no idea what i'm doing if i can um, be honest with you neither did i because i was like i you know a lot of <laughs> a lot of people will say to me uh hey i want to do this and i go okay and then i never hear from them again or they never right. produce, they never actually ship the product and you've been you know like you you're like oh i'm so sorry this third one got out late i'm like i'm uh i'm happy that the third one. <laughs> so i was i was in my thing is like all right go ahead i mean i think what was my response to you when you're like, I have this idea? Was I was I amenable? Was I polite? I don't remember. Oh yeah, you were you were polite. Like you weren't just like, oh yes, like do it now. But I mean, you were just like, okay, yeah, like let me know whenever you have something put together. And cool. yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, so I I really had no idea how it was going to turn out, and I'm super happy with how uh, all three issues have 
turned out so far. I know that's kind of tooting my own horn, but um, I think uh, all, all the authors who have contributed have um, wrote some really interesting content. And uh, I've definitely learned a lot about graphic design and formatting and all as I'm putting everything together. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it, it's really well done. And I really, really you. appreciate that you do it. And I really think it's such a great compliment. And I think it's one of the, um, I, I think it's because it's so new and we don't talk enough about it, that it's sort of the unsung jewel of the libertarian <laughs> the wall empire here. And so I just appreciate your time and effort that you put into it because I'm proud of it. It definitely reaches the quality that I want us to hit. And like, you're going to evolve it. You're going to grow it. It's just like doing a podcast where you start. You just have to start. You just have to keep moving. And mm -hmm. over time, like, you'll look back at that first issue five years from now and go, oh, my God. <laughs> but that's, that's super important, I think, when you're creating content is mm -hmm. just to start and evolve it over time. And the uh, curtains behind me are waving because of <laughs> So, um, so yeah, please go, go to wall reader. You can read the stuff online too at wallreader.com or at we're libertarians.com. I need the third export by the way. Um, oh, I'll so, send that to you. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll put that up on, on wall too, and put that out through our distribution network. But okay. yeah, so, but we really want you to go and get them on Amazon. You can get it on Kindle. And is there a third print edition coming? Uh, still working on that. Um, I'm not going to, bash Amazon because they the publishing you know they take their cut from it but it's all for free I just send them the files and they ship out physical copies when people order but they are not the easiest to work with at the same time so mm -hmm. okay. all right. <laughs> it, it, it's in progress <laughs> yeah I think as we go on and um, grow you I mean if you figure something else out yeah but I, I love the print version myself I just think mm -hmm. it's so cool to get that in the mail and see it and I'm very proud of what you've put together. And if, Thank you. if people want to contribute and write, how can they do that? Yeah, so um, they can obviously, uh, anybody who listens to the show knows like your email. Um, so like, I'm sure you could direct people to me, but uh, we have our own email set up. It's just thewallreader at gmail.com. Uh, you can email us there. Uh, we have a page on the website, wallreader.com, where people can um, submit um, ideas or stuff or uh, get a hold of us there. Um, we have a Facebook page, just wallreader. You can message us. Um, Instagram. So Instagram, yeah. Uh, there is a Twitter, but I, I'm a boomer with Twitter and don't know how to use it <laughs> hardly. So I don't think I've posted on the Twitter in several months which I should get better about that. But we, we, we can just set up an auto tweeter from your WordPress to, to Twitter and that, that can be- I didn't know that was possible. But. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll jump on a Zoom and do a screen share. But it, it, it is, Twitter is one of those things where like for a brand like that, it's just, just publish mm -hmm. so people see the update. You know, there's, um, and, and I'll give you the wall Twitter too if you ever want to get on there too. But okay. Um, all right, well, very good. Uh, so- Let's start with let's start with your past. Let's start with kind of where you began. Uh, did you grow up in a political household? Did you grow up into politics? I mean, you said you were really into journalism, but did that extend to politics? Like, what kind of ideology were you swimming in as a youth? As a, as a youth, as <laughs> would say. Yeah, well, so like I said, I I grew up like middle school, you know, reading the Limbaugh letter. Um, so <laughs> it was a, uh, and like my dad, you know, listened to like our local Fox talk radio station. He listened to that quite a bit. Um, and so it was, it was a pretty political household, like, uh, and obviously in the conservative sense, um, like I remember, this is bad. I, I don't know why I'm saying this, but in fourth grade, I was in fourth grade during the 2004 election and I got in trouble for cutting a picture of John Kerry out of the newspaper and taping it to the bottom of my shoe. Listen, I was in college and I got in trouble for the same thing, so it's okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, yeah, like I, you know, I didn't really know. I just knew like, oh, these are who my parents like, so I like them too. And this is what they think, so that's what I think. Um, so, yeah, like I think uh, being awareness of current events has always um, kind of been something in my life. And also uh, history. I've always been a big fan of history books and uh, documentaries and stuff. And I think a lot of that also goes back to my uh, grandpa. He was a World War II veteran. 
Um, so he was always down to, and his mind was like a steel vault. So he was always down to talk about, um, you know, all the stuff that he grew up through. Um, and yeah, and I mean, if you really get into the weeds of history, like history and politics are pretty inseparable, really. So. Oh, I, I totally agree. I think politics, religion, rhetoric, um, philosophy, history, it's just all intertwined. I mean, the liberal arts are the liberal arts for a reason. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're all one big pot. And I think that's one reason that I really like what you add to the network is because you, like Vaughn, like Reinhold, like a lot of us, we're all history fans. We're all philosophy fans. We're all religious in our own ways. And understand that that's all so, sort of one stream. That's that's sort of one stream of history, human thought. And that's mm -hmm. the big thing that I love here at, at Wall is like I, I really want to connect history with the present. Um, so, you know, you when did you start to go? All right, I may not be a conservative Republican like my parents. Yeah. Um, so that was really in uh, in high school um, in probably about junior year of high school. Uh, I'd always, I'd grown up in church and everything, but around junior year was whenever I started um, really taking, I guess, my faith more seriously um, or trying to make it more than just, oh, this is somewhere I go on, you know, Sundays and Wednesdays sometimes. Um, and whenever I started doing that, it was just sort of like a lot of the, uh, like, tenets of my conservative beliefs you know like I was all about uh, like strict borders and fully supportive of the war on drugs and you know like all the foreign wars and everything um, and it just kind of once I started taking my faith more seriously it was kind of like well these two are in conflict because Jesus is telling me to love my enemies and I'm over here cheering on you know carpet bombing Iraq so um, it's like something had to give and uh gradually you know piece by piece it was the uh it was my conservative beliefs that kind of got replaced by my christian beliefs um and uh you know i think probably the first thing to go was uh the war on drugs i was kind of like you you're like yeah they don't need to be locked up maybe just pay a fine and then gradually you know now i'm like legalized heroin um <laughs> but <laughs> it, always, it always like for me i when i was hired at the libertarian party of indiana in 2008 i'm like i don't know about all these guns and like <laughs> i don't know about all that like i don't know that anybody needs a gun uh -huh. and then but now i'm like i don't know why anybody wouldn't want a tank <laughs> you know <laughs> now you're a boogaloo <laughs> yeah no no i'm not I'm not that far <laughs> no pacifist like yourself which we'll get into don't let me forget because i want to talk about that but okay I, i'm definitely not like I, these Instagram kids are scary. Uh, so let's talk about your Christian faith. I mean, what, how would you define it? What are some of the central tenets of your Christian faith that you really find? Like, this is the part that's most meaningful to me that informs my political thought. Yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, I, I guess in a sense, you could say my entire political philosophy is summed up in three words. Uh, Jesus is Lord. Um, and if Jesus is Lord, that inherently means that Caesar or a president or Congress isn't. Um, and so, so like, I'm trying to think, for example, um, well, how I mentioned earlier, Jesus says, love your enemies. Um, and Jesus says, take care of the poor people. And Jesus says, welcome the stranger and, you know, all this stuff. Uh, and I think, Unfortunately, that uh, especially Western Christian Christianity has a tendency to over spiritual spiritualize a lot of the teachings of Jesus. Um, you know, we take this Sermon on the Mount, and uh, instead of like uh, this revolutionary political, like and religious uh, sermon, we turn this into well, this is just a bunch of like life lessons we're supposed to imply internally on an individual level. And I think there is some truth to that, but at the same time, you know, loving your enemies uh, and all the other teachings of Jesus have to have outward social implications. It can't just mean, you know, like, Oh, I'm really praying that, uh, you know, while I'm cheering on Iraq being bombed, I'm really praying for those Iraqi souls. I hope they get saved. You know, it's like, no, those two 
that doesn't work. You have Which to. Which is a lot of what Martin Luther King and his Vietnam speech spoke about. I mean, that sort of articulates that particular, the angle of how can you be a Christian and, and support war yeah. at the same time, which ultimately killed his career. And yeah. I mean, it really did end Martin Luther King Jr.'s career because he spoke, he was anti-war in during a war. Mm-hmm. Um, and how, how can you, I mean, sounds in a lot of ways like, and just from knowing you and talking to you that you do have a lot of the same kind of beliefs as Martin Luther King Jr. where, listen, these, the capitalist system is harmful to the, to the a person's soul. Uh, j- social justice is incredibly important. We need to lift the poor up. You know, you don't want to use government programs like he did, but mm. that, that seems to be a motivating factor. I mean, is that a fair comparison? I'm not calling you Martin Luther King Jr., but I'm saying <laughs> like, as I, as I have studied him, uh, your beliefs kind of sound parallel to his. Yeah, no, I think I think that's fair, and I take that as a compliment. Um, <laughs> maybe probably an undeserved compliment, but Could yeah, be. I think that's oh. a fair comparison. Uh, so, in terms of your Christian beliefs, like, are you a part of a denomination, or what sort of vein are you in? Yeah, so I grew up. Uh, You're watching Baptist. the video. I would say Mennonite. Mennonite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you look a little I, bit like Jesus, to be honest. Oh, thank you. Like the <laughs> the white Jesus that's in all the paintings. <laughs> Exactly. So you started Southern Baptist? Yeah, and I was uh, I went to a Southern Baptist church until uh, shortly after the 2016 election, um, and then just kind of faded out of that. And uh, uh, and then rec- for about a year, my wife and I have been going to a uh, Disciples of Christ church. Mm-hmm. Um, they're a smaller denomination, um, and it's they're a pretty decentralized denomination. It's pretty much they have like all the churches that are part of that. Um, it's like they have a few very key tenant beliefs, but other than that, it's just kind of like they all do their own things. Um, the one we go to is definitely like a more progressive church, um, I'd say, of the denomination. But So I've seen you talk a lot about Eastern versus Western and Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodox. Like what, what is that Because <laughs> I barely, you know, I'm busy, so I peruse the chat occasionally, but right. explain your thoughts about that. Well, so first off, a lot of my uh, picking on Eastern Orthodox and high church Catholicism is just to get it Dale Melcham. Um, okay. But <laughs> no, but I, and I think, well, how I, uh, how I was talking about a few minutes ago about how um, so many churches tend to uh, over spiritualize the teachings of the Bible and forsake like, like the social implications of those same teachings. Um, I think a lot of that is from the way that uh, Western Christians, and especially American Christians, um, read the Bible and view the Bible. Um, because I think, I mean, really Christianity is an Eastern faith, you know, it started in the Middle East. And uh, so I guess it's a Mideast faith, faith more than an Eastern faith, but you can't take it. I think if you take um, the Bible out of that the context of the culture and the world that it was written at written in um, you, you lose a lot of its meaning um, like for example uh, Jubilee uh, in the Gospel of Luke Jesus's very first public sermon he's calling for a for a year of Jubilee and in our Western readings of that we read that and it was like oh Jubilee that's joy happiness like Jesus is you know calling for joy, peace, and happiness, but then you look in that cultural context of what Ju- a year of Jubilee meant in that time, and he's talking about, you know, land redistribution, debt forgiveness, all this stuff that just gets lost whenever you don't view it through the lens of uh, the culture it was written in, um, and so, I, and I think, obviously, I, I think Christian Christianity is a very social-oriented faith, a very communal faith, um, and I think it's pretty clear in not just religious aspects, but in almost all aspects, there's a, a pretty clear divide between East and West of, you know, hyper individualism and then more social community based lifestyles. And organizations oh, yeah, you see that all. played out in the, in the book of Acts where they share everything. And when somebody <laughs> tries to save to keep some for themselves, they're basically zapped to death. <laughs> uh, they have a heart attack. Yeah. But who who are the two? Who's the couple that they, uh, Ananias who, and Sapphira? Yeah, it's Sapphira, yeah. and they they essentially the story is the 
the early Christian church had moved sort of outside of Jerusalem, had set up camp outside of town, and everyone had sold everything, put it into a common pot, to, invited anyone and everyone in. Everyone was equal. And Ananias and Sapphira had sold a lot of land. They were fairly wealthy, mm-hmm. and they had kept uh, a, a portion of that for themselves. They had hidden in their in their tent some uh, some wealth, and when it was found out, Peter rebukes them, and they both end up dying like on the spot <laughs> in a heart attack. There's there's a great uh, series that follows the book of Acts kind of closely. That is a really good illustration of it, and it's. Uh, by the people who made the Bible series. Like, I'm totally skipping on the name of the series, but it's on Netflix. Okay. I uh, think I've heard of that. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know. Email me if you're interested, but if you look <laughs> up, it, just put in Bible in the search and you'll see it. And it's like 80 or Acts or something. I don't know. It's really good. Um, and that scene particularly is a little disturbing, but it, it kind of <laughs> gives a visual to it. So, yeah, I think in in terms of the development of Christianity from – the 30s on but specifically in the 50s after the cold war and the rise of billy graham who i'm a christian because of billy graham i revere him i think he's a great Mm -hmm. man but the early evangelical movement that he really helped to solidify was uh, very anti-communist and helped in a lot of ways in trying to reinforce the idea that america is good the american government is good and that the Soviet government is evil. Mm-hmm. They're godless and evil, and we are, God, we are God-fearing and good. And that gave license to a lot of behavior by the American government over the last you know, 70, 80 years. And, and Christians tacitly uh, just going, yeah, if you're a good Christian, I mean, who was the pastor that just said, I think it was Jim Baker that said, you know, supporting Trump is a test of your ability to get into heaven. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just a that's the end result of kind of that that merging of the American government and Christian thought a, mm-hmm. as a power base. And within a lot of that is the individual ethic and the uh, the idea. I just saw uh, David Brooks wrote an article in, I think, The Atlantic about how oh, the nuclear family the nuclear family yeah. is basically because of our individualistic outlook and we've taken it too far and so over since from victoria times on and in conjunction with the the perversion of evangelical I, i'm an evangelical but i i agree with you that we have gone too far in turning our faith into an individualistic exercise and not applying it to our community but you know you look at how that idea of individualism, which is a foundational principle of libertarianism, so this is a sticky conversation. Um, yes, individual rights are incredibly important, but at the same time, we don't exist in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. You know, our, our families are, are weaker when we have killed off extended family and, and really just tried to focus on just mom and dad carry all the burden um, of the family. I think our churches are weaker because we've killed off the idea that we, we just outsource all the care for the poor to the government compared to a hundred years ago when mutual aid societies, I mean, here in Indianapolis, we have Methodist hospital or you have Southern Methodist university, or you have the children's Methodist home. And I grew up a Methodist and social action was an enormous part of the Methodist movement. And they built a lot of great institutions, private institutions that cared for the poor, that cared for everyone. And churches were a vehicle for funding a lot of social action. That seems to have completely ended. I think there is a movement within the modern evangelical church to get back to that. Um, I see churches like Matt Chandler in the Village Church, for instance, is actively shrinking the size of their megachurch. They're the fastest shrinking church in the United States because he's saying this megachurch thing is bad for the soul and we need to think about caring for each other in a community and not caring for ourselves, which that nineties boomer church mentality of, you know, you need to focus on your personal success in order to be a good Christian prayer. You're too young to remember the prayer of Jabez, but that was the hot book in the late nineties, early two thousands where somebody wrote this book about Jabez praying to expand his wealth and increase his lands. 
and it was the biggest selling book of the year and every church was doing a series on personal wealth and praying for i mean it was it it, it was that's just abhorrent to me <laughs> you, if you look up the prayer of jabez i think you'd freak out so i think you you have a fair criticism of the christian church and of our society at large in that we have allowed individualism become to become uh harmful to the idea of community mm -hmm. and we're seeing the fruits in the trump era of that sort of mentality yeah i think that's definitely fair to say um yeah i think so much of uh the trump era and you know the rise of people like trump and you know bernie sanders i'd say too um is caused by just this massive sense of anxiety and like people have no idea where they fall in the social order and they feel like you know they're just watching their communities fall around them and they don't know anybody and like nobody has uh you know like as many friends as they used to and stuff like that and i think that like these populist movements whether they're you know right or left are uh, definitely a symptom of that yeah uh, i think ben sass's book i don't know if you read them by ben sass but I haven't, no. No, I think you'd enjoy it, even though he's a Republican, Ryan. <laughs> it, it really is a great book on identifying why we have the rise of the kind of politics that we do, and mm -hmm. a lot of it goes back to the the de-evolution of – I mean, listen, if, you, if you're – I've said it on this show a million times. Like, if you're 30 years old and you move to a new city and you don't know anybody there and you're not religious, so you're not going to go to a church, and you're not necessarily political, so you're not going to join a campaign, how do you make friends – how do you meet no it? <laughs> yeah, like really, like do you know, I don't know, how old are you? Uh, 24. All right, 24. So, you know, you have college that can, can be a social vehicle, but if you're 30 and you're way out of college, like I don't know how people, my, I have friends who are just like, do you, do you want to hang out? I haven't had, I haven't hung out with anybody in three months. You yeah. know, I, I haven't seen a friend in three months. Like, and I just go, I don't know, man. I you know, I feel bad for you. Um, yeah, that, that breakdown of the social fabric. So how do we as libertarians start to kind of heal that and help people find community and, and escape tribalism? Yeah, so I think uh, the first, I don't know if the first, but one of the biggest things that libertarians as a group or a movement whatever you want to define it as needs to do is i just the total rejection of uh brutalism um i think brutalism like libertarian brutalism is just the most anti-social sociopathic ideology out there um just social darwinism to the extreme um and i think that that is something uh if libertarians want to actually play a serious part in mending like the moral or social fiber of our communities or our country or the world, um, we've got to get over this idea of, uh, you know, I'm here to take care of myself. I'm going to do whatever I need to, to better myself. And if you get left in the dust, then that's your fault. And entirely that's on you. Um, well, we had a conversation sort of similar in a recent episode with Adam on the path to libertarianism, mm -hmm. where he asked what responsibility people in positions of privilege have. And so how would you answer that? Like you and I are white men, and that does carry some level of privilege. Mm -hmm. But as Americans, I mean, our, as a society, we're incredibly wealthy. As middle class people, we're incredibly wealthy. It's not just about identities. It's also just about the place you're born, you know? Yeah. I mean, how, how do you view a, a person's responsibility to help people who might not have access to networks of power? Yeah. Uh, so I guess two, two quick disclaimers here. One, I, uh, I don't want to be called a hypocrite. So I realize that I'm pointing out the speck in other people's eyes and ignoring the log in my own. And to uh, the second disclaimer, I forgot what that one was. I'm sure it'll come up, but, uh, oh yeah, second disclaimer. I'm talking now about moral responsibility, not necessarily legal responsibility. Um, mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. But I think I would say that uh, like if 
I think it is immoral that you have, and I'm just going to go for the low hanging fruit, but you have people like Jeff Bezos who have more money than they could possibly ever spend um, or Bill Gates or uh, whoever Bloomberg um, unimaginable amounts of money. And at the same time, people like literally starving on the streets in some cases, I know that's not that common in America, but it does happen. Um, or, you know, at the same time, I, I could apply that to myself. I probably should a lot more than I do and say, well, I have, you know, an extra bedroom in my home and there's people like half a mile away sleeping under the interstate bridge. Uh, and I think that is a real, so I think we have a moral responsibility um, to help as much as possible, I guess. I don't know let's take, let's take the billionaire yeah. example. Like Jeff Bezos wealth is not just sitting in a money market account waiting to be spent. I mean, Jeff Bezos wealth is in, in basically in, in stock and invested in a company. So it's mm -hmm. not like that's liquid assets that he can. And that's sort of where I think this critique breaks down is like, I'm not saying that you don't understand his wealth, but it, it's, it seems like an easy, like you said, you admitted it's low hanging fruit, but I think Bezos has the ability specifically let's take Bill Gates because that's, there's a documentary on Netflix called inside Bill's brain that kind of walks through <laughs> Bill Gates and he's a highly controversial figure mm -hmm. um, to a lot of different people in a lot of different groups and, you know, anti-vaxxers and all that. But here's a person who started something in a garage built a tremendous amount of wealth mm -hmm. in, in a company and then has over time begun liquidating his investment and asset to then pour that into a charity and has persuaded other billionaires like Buffett, Warren Buffett to do the same to liquidate their billions and start actively. I mean, Bill Gates has funded the, the, the toilet that basically creates heat out of flushing your toilet for poor areas in Africa. And they're actively working on problems of extreme poverty, of disease, of the coronavirus. I mean, because Bill Gates lives in a capitalistic system, he has the ability to then turn his wealth into something that he can spend $147 million on fighting the coronavirus. I mean, so do you not see that disconnect where, yeah, it looks easy. It's an easy critique that it's unfair that guy has all that wealth, but Bill Gates is a great example of somebody who recognizes his responsibility. Yeah, and as soon as uh, you said Bill Gates, I regretted using him as an example for because right. <laughs> then I was like, oh, yeah, all that stuff he does. But, uh, okay, so Bill Gates wasn't a great person to use. Um, but I would I, – I think uh, even then, I think there is uh, – Well, let me, let me just argue back. Like – the Plainfield library that I grew up learning so much from was a Carnegie library. Initially, mm -hmm. if you look at the robber barons, which are so abused in from the left side, these are people who really funded a lot of the early institutions that now continue to help people. I mean, people who amass tremendous amounts of wealth, I think do get to a point where they start to go, man, this is, I really got to do something. I, I think it, they're the people, the people that fund, as I do Leaders and Legends, a podcast here and talk to charities, the people who are funding all of these nonprofits and charities that I'm talking to are the people that live in Indianapolis and have a tremendous amount of wealth. I, I think it, it is sort of an unfair criticism a lot of times to say that because someone has a lot of money, they just hoard it to themselves. I mean, am I being unfair to you? Am I being unfair to, to your point of view? Uh, no, I I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. So you've brought up a few things. So like with Bezos, the uh, illiquidity of a lot of his assets, that is, it's not like he's just sitting at home surrounded by stacks of hundred dollar bills and choosing. Right. He's not, not Donald Trump. Uh, well, it was Scrooge. Oh yeah. Scrooge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, that's fair. And that's important to keep in mind. Um, or like Bill Gates, you know, like he accumulated all this wealth and now he is spending it in ways that he thinks are, uh, or in, in really great ways, and he's trying to be responsible in how he does that and all. Um, and I think that's good. Uh, but it, well, especially with the robber barons like Carnegie and uh, Rockefeller and some of those others, um, 
they did fund some really great things like libraries and concert halls and arts and stuff. But uh, I, I don't think you can look at them and not look at how they accumulated a lot of that wealth. Um, how much of, especially the robber bearings, I'd say, you know, how much of that wealth were they able to accumulate because they bought off a bunch of Congress people and got them to sell them all this land for their railroads or, um, you know, or how many times did they use the federal army to break up a strike or, you know, things like that. Um, and so I, I think there's... Or, or the modern critique of Bezos and Amazon and its treatment of its workers. Yeah, well, I think, I think that's um, excellent, uh, really important to bring up too. Like a lot of Amazon workers uh, work in just terrible, awful conditions. Like I've heard multiple stories, you know, about women having miscarriages because their managers wouldn't let them sit down for five minutes in these warehouses and stuff. Um, and, and so it's like, I, I, whenever I look at all the money Bezos has uh, and how much money like Amazon is worth, I can't in my head, like I can't separate that from like how terrible some of these workers are treated. Sure. And I think people like yourself who make these critiques and support outlets that make these critiques have pushed people like Apple to go, all right, let's rethink our position with Foxconn. Let's start moving things back to California. Let's, let's spend some of our wealth to not enslave third world people. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's, well, okay. And I want to talk about the, the third world, like factories and all, because I, I used to be a big proponent, you know, and pusher of the, the idea that, oh, you know, like, yeah, we're, people are working in these sweatshops for, you know, like 20 cents a day but it's better than the alternative of working in an even more dangerous, you know, farming environment, making five cents a day. And it's like, well, yeah, it's true. Like that's a better alternative, but like, it's like, that doesn't mean it's a good alternative. It doesn't mean that right. that's what like those companies with those sweatshops should be doing. Yeah. So you sound a lot like AOC. Oh, man, I wasn't even going to bring her up because I know that you hate talking about her so much. But Well, we here's my thing with her. Okay, <laughs> my thing, and I was having this very argument as I do almost every day with Reinhold. Because Reinhold is so fixated on how awful Trump is, he misses how awful Bernie is. And it's not that he's wrong, but the fact that people are so critical and have been so critical of Donald Trump, it helps fuel the people that support Donald Trump. It helps give him rise. And so my thing with AOC is by constantly mocking her, by constantly, you know, making memes about how dumb she is or constantly like posting about her like Ben Shapiro does, you know, he can't, he can't miss an opportunity to make her look foolish or criticize her. And, you know, then he gives the caveat of, I'm not trying to make her important, but she's relevant. So I've got to talk about her. It's like, dude. <laughs> you're making her relevant on, on your side. And so it's like, I don't think libertarians learned from the Trump phenomenon the, the two lessons of the Trump phenomenon, which is if you're constantly bashing somebody, you're going to promote them. Yes. And their bad ideas will be spread further. And secondly, I think you do a disservice to the people that have an affinity for that particular person. And so... While I am critical of Trump and I am critical of AOC, you don't see me post a lot about that on social media, for instance, because it's hard to have the right context. And the people that I might want to be libertarians in three to 10 years are going to remember that I'm, uh, they're going to tune me out. They're not going to listen to me. They're not going to hear what I have to say. They're not going to tune into We Are Libertarians where they can hear more thoughtful critiques of those particular people. Mm -hmm. So I'm not against um, criticizing her or praising her when she's right or even against talking about her. I just think that it can go too far and it can be too mean and it can have the opposite ref uh, effect of what people are often trying to do, which just makes, gives her more power. And I don't believe that she's a person that deserves to have power. I think that this is an argument that you and I have. I think that AOC, Bernie Sanders, you know, they're, they're people that, if given power, don't understand the limits of power. They believe that, that that job of president or congressperson gives them unlimited power. They're ideologues in the way that Woodrow Wilson was. 
or FDR and look at how further they push the American system towards uh, uh, away from liberty and towards more authoritarianism. And so I think if Bernie Sanders gets elected president, I think there's no doubt that that person will use the executive orders and, and the more authoritarian aspects of his office to push us more towards. He's just another and he's just another swing of the Trump pendulum, but on the op opposite side. And and I think in some ways Bloomberg is that way too. I think if you look at Bloomberg's time as mayor, he was incredibly authoritarian. Oh, horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Um. And so. I, you know, Reinhold was arguing we've got to get Trump out because he's doing immeasurable damage. We may not survive as a republic, so even Bernie Sanders would be better. And I'm like, on what fucking planet are you living? You know what I mean? Like, and it's unfair yeah. for me to. We'll argue about this on a future episode so he can have his <laughs> have his future uh, combat. But like, my my problem with AOC is that I think she has she's she has no limits on how much power she thinks she should have and i think that is a particularly damaging person so even if she says things like uh, about criminal justice reform that libertarians like and maybe there's some opportunities to work with that person she doesn't believe what we believe at all you know and it's the same with tulsi gabbard like tulsi gabbard or andrew yang say things that we like but that doesn't mean that if they're in the presidency or have more power that they're going to start doing libertarian things overall. So that's my critique yeah. of it. I mean, where am I, where am I going wrong? Cause I know you have an iHeart AOC poster on your wall, right? <laughs> uh, no, but, uh, my wife does. Um, so <laughs> I, I think, I think you also like to post about AOC in the group because it pisses people like John Ulrich off and it makes you laugh. You're, you're a low key shit poster. Admit it. <sighs> yeah. Low key, low key. Um, yeah. So we'll, Okay, so I guess AOC. So I I agree. I don't think she – I would not say that she is a libertarian. Um, but I would say that she is, with the exception of Justin Amash, probably the most libertarian person in Congress um, because the issues that she's good on, she is very, very, very good on in my opinion. And there's quite a few of those, I think. Um, Immigration. Like immigration. Um, I can't think of a more libertarian person in D.C. on immigration than AOC. Um, criminal justice reform. Uh, foreign policy. She is definitely one of the more dovish people in foreign policy issues. Um, I mean, she's kind of heavy handed on foreign aid and all, but uh, everybody is. So I'm not going to hold that against her any more than I would against anybody else. Um, uh, let's see what else corporatism um, crony capitalism she's great at pointing out issues there and trying to deal with those um, and I say trying to deal with those because I mean a lot of her s proposed solutions do involve uh, bigger government and all but so I think she goes off the rails on her solutions but I think she points out a lot of issues that I don't really see many other people doing um and so i think whenever like 90 percent of libertarians are in that camp of you know screeching about how aoc is just the dumbest person ever and the devil and like stall and reincarnate i think yeah i feel like i have to balance that out by pointing out like actually like have you uh have you seen her stance on all these other issues and um like, I think she's somebody, I think she's somebody that, like, I don't know why she's not invited to, you know, like Liberty Con to talk about immigration or criminal justice. Like, they'll invite Thomas Massey, um, but not AOC, and that doesn't make but, sense. But to I me. think it's because her solutions are, use, she wants to use government force to rectify all those problems. And that is the breakdown for people like me, where I look at people like you and go, don't you see that the difference between Thomas Massey is that Thomas Massey is not willing to use force or is at least trying to mitigate the use of force, whereas AOC uses it gleefully. And that, that is the breakdown well, between her and us. In, in some things, uh, like going back to immigration, I, I don't really think she's wanting to use government force to address that. I mean, she's pretty much an open borders advocate at this point right which um, is a fair critique so on the things that we care about she's trying to remove the the government from those areas 
Yeah, or, you know, crony capitalism. She's all about, you know, rooting out these corrupt contracts with, you know, a lot of the military industrial un, industrial complex and like big pharma companies and all. Um, I think that's important. And I, you know, Thomas Massey, there's a lot of stuff where it's like, yeah, he's all about lessening government force, but at the same time, uh, he's he's a pretty big proponent of, uh, you know, the border wall and more border restrictions. Um, he's been in favor of uh, several issues or several um, issues surrounding, uh, you know, LGBT um, people and all that I would say lean more towards the authoritarian side of the scale. Um, so they all have their faults. Um, I, I just think AOC's faults are way over magnified and the positives of her are just completely ignored most of the time. Okay, that's fair. So let me help you save your uh, libertarian credentials. Um, I, and, and I'm so surprised we're getting this so late. That's my apologies as a host. But like, when did you decide to apply the word libertarian to yourself? Uh, after, okay, so, man. I think I started using that term to describe myself uh, after probably shortly after the 2012 election. Um, I wasn't old enough to vote in that one. Uh, but afterwards, um, I had this friend in high school and he was all talking about like, man, this sucks. You know, he's like, every, like Obama and Romney are just trash. And he's like, have you heard of Ron Paul? And I'm like, no. And so he's, and I don't know, how, well, I think I'd heard of him, but I never really like listened to him or anything. And he sent me all these like YouTube links and I started watching him. It's like, yeah, like I agree. Like, because even then when I was, I was definitely, I would say more of a, like a status progressive type than a libertarian. It's like, oh yeah, he's solid on civil liberties and, you know, uh, foreign policy and all this stuff. So it's like, I definitely think I started applying that term. It's like, yeah, I'm like libertarian on these issues. Um, full fledged, just like, oh, I'm a libertarian. That was probably, uh, that came along really, I'd say with uh, a, like, whenever the Black Lives Matter movement really started up, um, like 2014, I think, just because I got to, that was really showing me, like, you know, all those instances of police violence, like, oh, this is what supporting, like, some of these, like, progressive laws results in. Um, you know, you can't have, like, the nice, dreamy progressive laws without the police out there enforcing them also. And so that made me realize that it's like, nah, I've got to get rid of the, the state force part of my beliefs right and so in the libertarian movement there's a lot of people who go oh this person became a libertarian because of black lives matter they're not a real libertarian they're they're just <laughs> it's closet liberals there's you know there's a lot of people trying to uh I'm, I'm blanking on the senator there's a lot of mccarthyism going on in the libertarian movement right now against people like yourself which i feel is unfair um, because you're a libertarian, I wouldn't have you on my network if you weren't a libertarian because you don't believe in the use of government force. You just care about issues that the Mises Caucus doesn't. And uh, I'll just say, you know, a lot of, I'm not saying the Mises Caucus, but a lot of people within that wing of the movement are the McCarthyites yeah. in a lot of ways. And how do, you, how do you look at that? How do you interpret that? And how do you sort of process it yourself as somebody who is on their blacklist? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's silly to me because I I have a pretty uh, broad definition of libertarian. I think if you you know I don't think it has anything to do with like uh, the non-aggression principle or you know economic beliefs necessarily anything. I think if you I'd say even just on net like if you want to decrease overall government more than you want to increase it, I you're you should be considered a libertarian you know um i mean that gets because it's like oh i want to i'm like 51 percent for decreasing government it's like well that's kind of iffy but in, right. in general that's how i view it so i think i think the whole idea of uh especially when libertarians are already such a small camp wanting to run out people who um like from the party or from the label even who call themselves libertarians trying to 
decrease that number even more is just kind of silly. Uh, and But at the same time, because I think libertarian is such a vague, big tent word, um, it also doesn't always have as much meaning as I should. And there is a lot of confusion because obviously like somebody in the Mises caucus is they're like they're all libertarians but their world's different than somebody in the Libsock caucus or even somebody in like the pragmatic caucus um so i think it's important to recognize those distinctions but like you said just like this like mean-spirited mccarthyism i think is definitely counterproductive and if you want to be against libertarian other libertarians so bad it's like why don't you just join the republican or democrat party but <laughs> i'm not i mean I'm not like you and I disagree on a lot of stuff. A lot of times it feels like like, and I don't, and that's not a sign of me not liking you. Don't take it that way. I, just, <laughs> uh, I like to needle. Um, but I, and I also like the foil. Like I like the conversation. Like I like that Reinhold and I disagree on so much, mm -hmm. but agree on so much. And that's a big reason why he's on more is because he is somebody that I, I want to, I want him to challenge me and I want to challenge them. I think, like our conversation today is me challenging you and you going, here's why I believe what I believe. And then you walk away and maybe you go, I don't know about my answer there. I have to go back that up. Or you, you know, you had well, well thought out answers to my challenges today. And that makes me go, okay, this person knows what they're talking about. They're informed. They're not, you know, just shouting, talking points at me or, you know, and that makes then that'll make me go, you know, that guy really is smart and I care about these things, but I hadn't thought about caring about this thing. And so maybe I ought to think about that more because of, you know, being more of a right libertarian and you a left libertarian makes me go having having you on the network has made me go, you know, I think like I don't I've never heard of the concept of eliminating prisons. So go <laughs> and read about that and talk about that. It makes one in intellectually stronger mm -hmm. and likewise you walk away from today and go you know that bezos answer or this answer or that answer like i wonder let me go do more research let me think about that through more i hadn't thought about it like that or i hadn't x y and z it's yeah, a definitely. friendly it's a friendly conversation where you and i are learning from each other from opposing viewpoints that is a much more powerful way to convert someone to your way of thinking when it's friendly and conversational and you're not trying to kick some i'm not I'm not going you, Ryan. I'm closing down Wall Reader if you don't stop saying X, Y, and Z. <laughs> if you don't stop praising it. I, I have said to you, I'm like, hey, listen, man. Like, tone down the AOC just a little bit because in the group, it, I don't want to, like, ru run too many people off. So, because, you you know, it was, like, f pretty frequent. Now, that's the closest. <laughs> agree with, uh, like, agree with me now. That, that's the closest I've ever come to saying to you, like, hey, dude. You know, because I want you to say what you want to say. I want you to challenge people like John Ulrich because there's a lot of people watching those conversations going, all right, point that guy, point this guy. But there shouldn't be this thing where you go, this guy said something nice about AOC. I'm kicking him off the network. Yeah. That's just going to push you further away from ever hearing anything I have to say and vice versa. So yeah. I don't get, I don't get the tactic at all because I'm sure you look at somebody like a Joshua Smith and go, I could care less what that guy ever has to say about anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and to be fair, I'm, I, uh, I, I'm not like involved in like the libertarian party, um, like the minutia of that at all. Um, never really have been it. And I don't want to be frankly based on what I've seen, but <laughs> you're on the right track. Yeah. No, I'm you're learning from Wall and walking away from that. Yeah, I'm just like at this point, like, yeah, sure, give the nomination to Vermin. I don't care. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I and I think, I don't know. I just don't really care for, I think, discussing ideas um, and making allies and friends where we can is way more important than like party politics or electoral politics or any of that. Especially, like, I think Trump is the perfect example of this. You know, he got into – if you don't have, like, that establishment connection whenever you get elected to something, whether it's president or mayor or whatever, you know, 
your entire administration is just going to be ran by like the technocrats who are already there. So yeah. it's like, what's the point in trying to win elections really? Perfect. Well, shameless self-promotion time. Is there anything that you, you know, you've been around wall for a while. I have a, uh, wrongly not not intentionally but just it just hasn't worked out for whatever reason i haven't had you on the show <laughs> uh, you've been around for a while like it's your time to just speak to the people it's the floor is yours self-promote is, is there oh, something boy. where you're just like man i gotta say this i want people to hear it um man i'm trying to think Whew, you put me on the spot no uh yes well like we've already said uh wallreader.com you can check out our three issues there all that content um i think i think there's a piece i wrote for the second issue that uh is probably my the favorite one that i've worked on so far it's all about uh the death penalty um and my reasoning for why the death penalty should be abolished um and i'm i'm pretty proud of that piece and it also touches on we didn't really have time this morning uh to get to it but it touches on some of my um like christian pacifist beliefs and gets into that um so i would ask that uh well i'd highly recommend go check out wallreader.com and then ask if you wanted to check out that article um about the death penalty like i said it's in uh issue two i it was titled um uh, is this justice? I believe was the title. Um, so yeah, go check that out. Let, um, let, let's talk about the pacifism because I forgot about okay. that. Thank yeah. you for reminding me. Let's take a couple minutes or five minutes or whatever. We don't have time constraints. I'm just trying to be respectful of your time. But um, a lot of people call themselves a pacifist, and I may have used that term for myself in the past because you you want to be a pacifist as a Christian. You want to to go that far. Mm-hmm. But you really are a pacifist. You're the you're the only libertarian pacifist that I actually know. Oh, wow. uh, and, and so, what does that look like? What does that mean for you? Yeah, uh, just basically comes down to all life is precious, um, and regardless of what people do with their lives, or uh, you know what, even like the most heinous actions they might they might commit. Uh, they're still a human being and they're they're precious to Jesus. So as a Christian, they should be precious to me too. Um, you know, and I just think uh, like, and also, you know, it's the idea of uh, the ends justify the means. Like if I'm in danger from somebody else, obviously like the end of trying to preserve my life, uh, that's not, that's a good thing. I should try to preserve my life. But if the means um, to do that involve, uh, you know, taking the life of somebody else, which I think is in a way saying that their life is less precious than mine, um, then I think that's wrong. Um, so somebody breaks into your house and comes to attack you, do you not fight back? I mean, what does that, <laughs> that mean? Like, well, I I don't think anybody can fully 100% certainly answer that question regardless of if they're a pacifist or not but sure. what I would hope to do is uh, you know I think I, it doesn't mean passivity um, like I think a great alternative uh, is you know there's all sorts of non-lethal things pepper spray for example um, or hornet spray if you're a redneck in Missouri and can't don't want to buy pepper spray but uh, wasp spray has been recommended to me so much lately oh uh, yeah it yeah. shoots out way further it's stronger like yeah uh, like it jet makes sense. fuel or something yeah <laughs> so so i i don't want to say like well i think ideally nobody would ever hurt anyone but if there's a choice between you know like breaking somebody's arm or having yourself be killed i think obviously yeah break the arm you know if you, that's what you have to do um so i, I don't it doesn't know I mean, necessarily on a personal level mean not fighting back but on a global level it certainly does you know like if somebody yeah. if so is in your opinion an attack by another nation on the united states is that do we not have license to then go to war against them or how do you reconcile that with war right so i i 
I say that I subscribe to uh, just war theory. The only problem is that no war is actually just. Um, so, because war, especially in the modern sense, um, really ever since uh, World War One, World War Two, I'd say um, war is inherently going to involve the death of civilians. Um, there, there's just no way to avoid it, especially now with like this asymmetric warfare where it's like nation state against non-nation state and all that stuff. And, you know, you've got weapons of mass destruction and bombs and everything involved. Uh, it, it's just impossible to avoid the death of civilians in war. You know, if it was just like the actual soldiers fighting and dying, like that would, that alone would be a tragedy, but I think you could make more of a case for justifying that. Um, you know, but like whenever 9-11 happened and 3,000 Americans died, we responded by if we had just went and, you know, bombed the Taliban camps, whatever, and only the Taliban had died, uh, it's like, okay, maybe we can justify that. But uh, I don't think there's, you can't say that military action isn't going to kill civilians. And because of that, I don't think it can ever be justified. I don't think uh, any, the loss of any innocent life is worth any sort of military or political goal. So your maybe a way to interpret it and tell me if this is fair is that even though our nation has lost lives, it it doesn't mean that they're it's worth their so it's almost the you're you're weighting the lives of the innocent above uh the the restitution, the justice of it. Because to fight one injustice would to commit another injustice. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm glad you brought justice up, and definitely, yeah, I think that's I I, be, I agree with that. Yeah, the lives of the innocent are more important than a sense of uh, justice or restitution. But I think that gets into you know what really is uh, justice. Like if we and this I touch on this in my death penalty article too. But if somebody murders somebody else and then we kill that murderer, like in a sense, that's like a shallow justice, I guess, but I think justice is less about punishment and retribution and much more about uh, uh, restitution, making things whole. Um, so 9-11, they, they attacked us and we can get, you know, a cheap, shallow justice by taking out the people that attacked New York. Um, but a deeper, more meaningful justice is you know, like we have to actually look at like, you know, like why did they attack us? And like all the, and obviously there's a ton of like influences on that, like why they did what they did um, and look at our part, you know, it's like, how, what can we do different to prevent this in the future? Or, you know, even it's like, yeah, these people helped attack us, but we, you know, 10 years ago, we bombed their entire family over in Kenya. So it's like, um, so I think real justice is you have to look at the big picture and it, I mean, it's an exhausting process, but it forces you to get creative and looking at how can we, cause I think real justice, nobody has to die for real deep justice to happen. Um, so it's like, how can we make this right or work at least towards making things right and whole with everyone involved in the situation. And that includes the victims and the perpetrators. Uh, cause I think, most of the time people that hurt people are just people who were hurt themselves earlier. So if you're not making things whole with everybody, then it's not real justice. Well, that's a great place to stop. And that was a fascinating conversation. And I thank you so much for, for joining me and I hope people learned a lot. And I hope uh, that uh, listen, next time you run into a left libertarian, know that they're very thoughtful and very intelligent. Like Ryan, <laughs> they're not the thank devil. You. Okay, people, they're not they – have a conversation with them. Don't just try and rant them out of the movement um, because that was a fascinating conversation. And I thank you so much, Ryan. I thank you for everything you do for We Are Libertarians, and I hope that people will go buy Wall Reader, support his work, and uh, I greatly appreciate everything that you do. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. All right. We will talk to you next week.